If y'all would turn in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 6, verse 25. I'll do the Christmas stuff uh, next week. We'll really get into that. But I wanted to uh, try to get really get out of, uh, get finished with chapter 6 uh, before the year's out. If you need a Bible, please raise your hand. Jersey Tom is back there. We need one up here in the front, please. One back over here, too. We're going to run you everywhere there, Tom. Get your exercise today. We'll get one to you regardless. Um, we're in Matthew chapter 6, verse 25 is where we're going to start. I think it is something, it's the Lord's timing is, is really awesome because, you know, we talked about the portion of, uh, of the Sermon on the Mount about fasting the week of Thanksgiving. And now here we are, we've been talking about materialism and ain't, we're talking about anxiety and worry over such things this week. During the Christmas season, when everybody's running around trying to, you know, spend more than they have and, and, and all that kind of stuff, and then worried about how to pay it off next year or whatever. But we do get kind of caught up in this. But that's the Lord's timing. I, I, I'm not one of those guys that has enough forethought to plan messages months in advance. That's not me. You know, I, can't, I really don't know exactly right now how, how many verses we'll take in uh, once we pick back up with this. After Christmas, I just don't go that far out. Tomorrow is just, well, I usually don't even get to thinking about tomorrow. So I didn't plan it this way. This is just the way God is, has, uh, has, has born and out. But we want to talk about how today, about how your life is worth so much more than, than, so, than what so many of us uh, place our values in. There was this investment banker who um, had made a ton of money, and that's great, fine. Make all you want. But he had made all this money, and he bought him his brand new uh, Mercedes sports car. I don't know what you call it, because all they got letters on those things, you know, SL500s or whatever. Um, is that one of them? It's one of these high-dollar <laughs> cars that are real expensive and break a lot. Um, I tell people, if you want it to last a long time, buy Asian. If you want to look good and be in the shop all the time, buy, buy, buy European. Um, but he was running this expensive car down all these curvy roads, you know, out just really just winding up, running it through the gears and, and just really having a blast with this thing. And all of a sudden, he lost it, lost control of the car. It starts getting sideways, and he's trying to fight it and everything. And he realizes he's going toward the cliff. He's got to get out of the car. So he bails out at the last second. The Mercedes goes over the cliff you know, down hundreds of feet to the bottom. And he's just standing there, and he, he's all beat up and banged up. He doesn't realize his arm is missing. It got hung in something. Um, he's, he's lost an arm at the shoulder. And, uh, but he doesn't realize that. He's in shock, and he's just staring over the edge, looking down at his car. Well, a truck driver was behind him and saw all this happen, and he finally got the big truck stopped and ran over there. And he gets to this guy who's just standing, and he keeps going, My Mercedes. My Mercedes, my Mercedes. And the truck driver said, man, forget about the car. You got bigger issues. We got to get you to the hospital. You're missing an arm. And the guy goes, my Rolex, my Rolex. <laughs> you know, and that's the way some people think. That's the way some people think. But... A couple of weeks ago, we had looked at the, the, the first passage where Jesus was talking about materialism, and he keyed in on three main points. Which the first was that where your heart is, there your treasure is also. That's a foundational principle. You cannot get around that. There's no way to loophole it. It doesn't matter. Look at your checkbook, and you can see where your main concerns are. The second was on a single-minded focus and vision towards the kingdom of God. Being focused, a single eye, as a good eye is the way it's worded in some translations. The third was that of choosing your master, whether your master would be God or materialism, chasing after the, you know, sometimes you got to just get back to Luke and Bach, Texas. You know, for some of us been a four-car garage and we're still building on. Some of you see, that doesn't, too many people that don't know those good songs from back in the day. Then I have to explain them. It really adds to the sermon time. So if y'all want to cut down on how long you're in here, just laugh when I say that stuff so I don't have to explain it. 
But he, the third was that, uh, that of choosing whether your master was going to be God or materialism. And then the, this next section, where we are today, it only makes sense and it only works for the true believer who puts his or her heart or treasure um, uh, in their focus, single-minded focus, only on the master that can provide them with entrance into the kingdom, that being, of course, the God of the Bible and our Savior Jesus Christ. So for the person who has shunned materialism, who is singly focused on the kingdom and has chosen to follow God, the balance of this chapter is both a comfort and a command. Because depending on what scholars you start go looking at here, some will say it's, this is a Jesus comforting us, some will say this is a command. I can't get out of either, it's both. And as you understand the Jewish mind, and you, you get to where the, the, the Israelites and their philosophy and all their scholars, you have to understand they hold things in tension. They have no problem with God being sovereign and free will at the same time. It's the Greek mind that wants to divide that and has to put everything in its little categories. The Hebrew mind has no problem keeping these things in tension and suspending them there and having them parlay off of each other. But here... You don't have to have it, is it a command, is it a comfort? The answer is yes, it is both. You hold, hold these, both of these ideas in tension. So, if you look at verse 25, Jesus speaking here says, Therefore, I say to you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. Now, that's 2,000 years ago. Those are the same issues people worry themselves to death about today. You know, what am I going to wear? Does this make me look fat? Tell me. You know, no, you're lying. Am I supposed to say, yeah, that, that's unconsciousness right after that. You can't win. You just learn to go somewhere else. Um, but these are the same things we still worry about today. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing. Look at the birds of the air, for they neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns. Yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? Which of you, by worrying, can add one cubit to his stature? So why do you worry about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin, which means to weave. And yet I say to you that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Now if God, and here's the conclusion he comes to, now if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is, meaning that it's growing today, tomorrow is thrown in the oven, they use it to start fires, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? Therefore do not worry, saying, what shall we eat, what shall we drink? What shall we wear? For after all these things the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these things shall be added to you. Therefore do not worry about tomorrow. For tomorrow will worry about its own things. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. So once again, we see throughout all of this sermon, Jesus is reprioritizing our world. And it's easy for those things to kind of, as you get bumbling around the world and trying to move through society and everything else, for things to start shaking and the heavier stuff to settle down. The heavier, I, by, by heavier, I mean the more important things to kind of settle to the bottom and all of a sudden this other stuff to kind of creep to the top. He says it's, it's a matter of priorities. And that's what he's talking about today. So let's look um, at verse 25. It begins with the word, therefore. And what does that mean? When you see that, you have to ask, what is it there for? Now that is in proper English, but that, the, the, the analogy there works. It's a word that connects two different passages with a single thing, theme in mind. Verse 25 is working off of what Jesus said that we talked about a couple of weeks ago. That word connects these two. Sometimes you can say, in my own mind, when I get to therefore, I'll read back over and I'll say because. Because of what is in the preceding verses, now we can, you can digest what he is giving us in these verses. 
And these verses can be hard to stomach if they aren't connected to the previous text because that is the context in which he's working here. By not connecting them together, these two sections, we're lifting them from their context. And that is always dangerous. That's when you get to drinking Kool-Aid and running off to the jungle or lighting candles to dead people or what have you. Um, by taking things out of context. And that's never a good thing. So look at verse 25. Therefore I say to you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Now once again, these verses only work for the believer. As followers of Jesus, we are the apples of his eye, and you need to know that. We are the magnum opus of his creation, the crowning achievement of all of creation, as we're going to see in more detail shortly. But because of this fact, because we are the crowning achievement of creation, well, Jesus, is, is, they're sitting there, the Trinity, the Lord is sitting there at the beginning before any of this is created. He said, you know, let's make this creature that will be in our image. It's going to cause me all this heartache and pain. And, and don't you have it? Don't you think, why would he do that? Well, hadn't you, you decided to have children at one point? It's the same thing. Um, you know, someone with whom to fellowship. But because of this fact that we are the crowning achievement, if we're focused on God and his kingdom, if we are sold out for him, recognizing him as our master, then, and only then, we can go through life without these things being our main focus. And that's what is at stake here. Because this doesn't mean that we're just to lie back, smell the roses all day, sipping mint juleps on the porch without a care in the world. That is not life. That is not reality. It wasn't Jesus' life. But we are to be so focused on his kingdom that these things, food, clothing, cars, houses, and all that stuff, are not to be our primary goals in this life. But that is part of the American dream, isn't it? I mean, that's what we're all shooting for. We've all seen people who are all about climbing the corporate ladder and obtaining social status through their possessions and such. And like I say, if you're good at what you do, you deserve to climb the ladder. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about the person who that person that is their focus. I've got to climb. I've got to climb. And, and whoever is under me when I start climbing the ladder, I just hate it for you. That's something altogether different. While those people seem to have it all, and they seem to be the happiest among us, because we see them on television, you, all the shows are about the rich people, right? The reality shows, you think, how in the world, you know, it was the show, I can't stand it, it drives me nuts, but I have to watch it sometimes. The people that are going to buy a house, you know, they got three or four houses, somebody's showing these houses, and we've only got a million dollars in the budget. I'm going to take a half million to, to, to re, redo the house. Oh, God, life is so hard. Man, if I'm, and I start thinking, if I had a million dollars, what would I do with it? I'm not wasting it all on a house. No way. I have, well, unless it was like half of it's a library, I would do that. But, you know, th that's the stuff you see. And they, oh, man, they've got it together. Everything is so groovy, and it's all great and all that. But what you, you have to understand is they got issues too. All things are common among men. And what you have to understand is that they have created a monster. And now they have to feed it. Because now they got to make the house note on this thing. Which I, I don't even know what the note would be on something like that. I'm afraid to think about it. And what it would be on a million dollar house. Well, we've only got ten grand a month to pay to the bank for the house because we've got two Mercedes and a Rolex to... You know, and these aren't the people that go and rent to own. You know, they go buy this stuff. So we tend to think they've got it all under control and everything is just great. But that's not so. I don't know how many of y'all remember Ross Perot there. I'm giving my age again. But he was a millionaire, a gazillionaire, whatever, ran for president one time. And he said this. He said, guys, just remember. And I'm thinking in that voice of his, you know. So, <laughs> guys, just remember. Little bitty guy with that nasal voice. If you go out and get real lucky, if you make a lot of money, if you go out and buy a lot of stuff, it's going to break. you got your biggest, fanciest mansion in the world. It has air conditioning. It's got a pool. Just think of all the pumps 
that are, are, are going to go out or go to a yacht base in any place in the world. Nobody is smiling, and I'll tell you why. Something broke that morning. <laughs> the generator's out. The microwave oven doesn't work. Things just don't mean happiness. So the more you have, the more about which you have to worry. You know, I know a guy one time that um, he said that folks showed up one day to, they were repoing his refrigerator and a bunch of other stuff, and they thought he was going to fight them. He said, no, I'm going to help you load it. Really? We're taking your stuff. He said, yeah, I don't have to worry about paying for it anymore. That's a true story. Now, I don't know how his wife was going to react to no refrigerator when she got home or no washing machine or dryer. You know, maybe she's going to put him to washing because he couldn't pay for it. I don't know. But we think, we tend to think when it talk, we're talking about money and affluency and the, the cares of this world or, or, or any materialism in general, we tend to think that just applies to the wealthiest among us, but that isn't so. Because to the guy making $50,000 a year, the person that's making $100,000 a year, he should be happy. What's he got to worry about? He's making hundred grand a year. But the guy eking out a living, you know, work, delivering pizzas and working at McDonald's and, and picking up cans on the side of the highway or whatever, to him, the guy making fifty grand a year should be happy. What's he worried about? He's not working from can to can, trying to you know, scrape pennies together. We all tend to think that if we made a little more, we'd, we would be satisfied. But that just isn't so. How many of you here have ever gotten a raise in your life? All right, at some point you probably did, even if it was just, you know, what we used to call COLA, cost of living allowance, you know, which is like 0.0831% or something, you know, whatever it is. Uh, but if you ever gotten a raise and you think, oh, now we have plenty of money. No, you don't. No, you don't. Even if it was a big raise. I worked for a company one time, and I was there, and I worked salary, and all of a sudden, the, the business was booming, we were doing well, and the boss comes in and gives me a, a, I think it was like a six grand a year raise, which back in the 90s was a decent amount of money. And, um, you know, I remember going home, and, whoa, look at all six grand, what can we do with six grand, you know? And my wife, who was a bookkeeper, of course, goes, you realize that's like $500 a month before taxes? Oh, just blew my bubble. I mean, I thought we were in the money. No. Yeah, it informed me that I still wasn't making what I was making at the job I had previous to that. But the point was, you know, we think if we just had more money, it would be all right, but it doesn't work that way because we tend to spend what we have. We never seem to get to the point where we have extra money. There's always something or someone with their hand out ready to collect it. As I was a, when I was a kid, I remember we were in the, this drugstore one. It was cold. I remember that. And there's a little short man standing there. How many of y'all remember Beta, Beta Max, Beta tapes, and all that? You know, the they're like a little bit bigger than eight track. If you remember those, there's this little man there, and and he's trying to buy all the Beta tapes that are left in this Eckerd's or whatever the drugstore was. And I'm standing behind him, and he was a kid I know. They don't even, nobody even has those anymore. Nobody even has the, the VCR for it. If we'd gone up to, you know, VHS by then. This is, I don't know, 80, or 1980 or so, something like that. I'm sitting there, and, and this guy, and he, what he does is he, he takes all these and he said, give me a deal on all these. I'll buy all these if you'll give them to me right now. I'm saying, Come on, man, just, I can't stand that, you know. You go to Jerusalem, they want you to barter with them, dicker with them back and forth. I'm like, just pay it and get out of the store. But this guy, he's sitting there, and he's trying to get a deal on his beta tapes because nobody uses them anymore. And so he finally sits there, and he, he works out something. He turns around and speaks to my father and then leaves. And uh, I said, Dad, who was that guy? He said, well, that's Jack Stack. Who's Jack Stack? He's an oil man. He's worth millions. I said, he's worth millions, and he's sitting here dickering over some obsolete technology. And I didn't say it that way because I was too young. But that's what I'm thinking. And he, I said, he's sitting there worried about saving $2 on a stack of old videotapes. He said, son, that's why he's got money. 
because he's willing to do that. And he wasn't a cheap man. This man bought people's medications. He paid people's rent. He was a very generous man. But when it came to his stuff, he was, I would say, cheap. Anybody wants to stand there haggling over beta tape. But that's the way it was. Son, that's why he has money. Because he's frugal with it. So even that man who had all that he needed, I mean, he had a two or three, he had two huge homes there in town. But um, he was, still wasn't caught up in materialism. And then so Jesus says this, he asks the rhetorical question, is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Now all human life has innate value because we are created in the image of God. And, but we cannot put a dollar value on our lives. I know they might say, well, so-and-so is, he's worth $50 million or something. Those are his assets. But his life, you can't put a dollar amount on that. Because we've been purchased, each one of us, at the highest price that can be paid, the life of Jesus. We have been bought and paid for by God with the life of Christ, the God-man. Therefore, our lives are worth the life of Jesus. So I ask you, are our lives not worth more than these things that Jesus has listed, these categories that Jesus has listed? Is that all there is to our lives? When we've been bought and paid for with such a price, not to the believer. No, that's not all there is. And he goes on to make the point, verse 26, Look at the birds of the air, for they neither sow, means to plant, nor reap, nor gather into barns, meaning to harvest, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? Which of you, by worrying, can add one cubit to his stature? So he says, look at the birds, they're well fed. God designed the whole ecosystem. But people seem to think evolved by random chance, even though it has more organization than, than you know, uh, a gazillion libraries. But if you observe squirrels and birds and that sort of thing, if you want to, go to the Putney's house and sit on their downstairs porch. You'll see birds and snakes, raccoons. See squirrels that just maul the bird feeder and rob it blind. They figured out how to open the thing, take the lock out, crawl over in there and everything else. But you'll see that whatever type of animal life you're looking at, they're busy. They don't just lie around in the trees and wait for God to drop food to them. They are busy about their business, but they aren't worried about it. Because some people say, whoa, well, I guess I don't have to work. I'll just lay around here. God's going to drop manna from heaven on me. Well, he's done that in the past. I wouldn't count on him doing it right now for you. This is, you know, where the Bible talks, talk, talks about, you know, if you don't work, you don't eat. Very important thing we need to remember nowadays. But it's not about laying around and God's going to drop it to you. We are to be busy about our business. You ought to, if you're an able-bodied man, you ought to be out there su uh, supporting your family. One thing, I have no tolerance for those that don't, if you're able-bodied. But you ought to be out there supporting your family. But you aren't to be worried about it. Worry about, oh, God, I need a bigger car. You see the difference between supplying for your family and being trapped in materialism. And it's this point that Jesus is making. They are busy, the animals, the birds and all, but they aren't fretting and they aren't trying to build the biggest nest in the forest. They get and store food, bring it back to their families and their babies, but they aren't sitting there on a limb like this. You know, see most squirrels like this. You see most birds like this. They aren't going... You never see that. If you do, it's been photoshopped, I promise you. But they aren't sitting on a limb like that, get working themselves into a tizzy, because even they realize that life is worth more than these things. They kind of take it as it comes. They go out there diligent, but they're not sitting on a limb um, fretting about that, which brings us back to the point Jesus is making. If he has supplied that and the system is set up so they can eat, our lives are worth more than theirs. Oh, no. No, no, not out of the day. Not out of the day. We are just creatures. As Ernest T. Bass would say, we are just creatures. We're even with the animal kingdom. No, we're not. No, we're not. I guarantee you, if it comes down to you running over a child or a deer, you're going to hit the deer. Even the, most, the person that feels like all creatures are, or all creation is equal. No, they're going to make a choice. There's a reason that Adam and Eve were the last of God's creation. Because they were placed into a turnkey environment. Do you know why? Because everything was created for them. 
Jesus didn't come and die for the birds, the squirrels, or any other creature. Now, you, if you got a little frou-frou dog, I know you want to argue that point. I'm not discussing whether little Sophie is going to be in heaven or whatever. We're not dealing with that today. All right? I love my animals too. But, you know, I'm not going there. But Jesus paid the ransom for us, for humanity. I know that in politically to correct to say that sort of thing, that, you know, we're, we're above all the other creatures. But we are. The Bible makes that clear. Everything else was created, and then man and woman, mankind, Adam, were placed into that with everything else already there and working. So why do we worry? If we are the magnum opus, if we are the top of the food chain, so to speak, if we are the, the whole reason for all of this creation to begin with, why do we worry when we see how he's taking care of those the creatures that were below us? Or more importantly, I should say this. Why do we worry about these things that Jesus has specifically listed, these categories, when our Heavenly Father provides them for us? Now, it is important to see this way. Jesus doesn't say we aren't to worry about other people's food. Because I can see people now, oh, they're starving to death. Hey, birds got it. Tighten up. He doesn't say anything about not worrying about other people's food. We are to help and give and do all that and food banks and you know do whatever you, you see someone on the side of the road with the sign or whatever and, and eating food or you know someone that's falling on hard times that's one thing but it's about our own as believers that we don't sit around fretting all the time about those things because this comes on the heels this whole section of scripture comes on the heels of a model prayer where Jesus tells us to ask for our daily bread Yet at the same time, he tells us that man shall not live by bread alone. And too many of us are killing ourselves trying to live on bread alone. Regular bread. Instead of the word of God. And that becomes the focus. In the real word, what really sustains us, if you don't ever get the spiritual side of Christianity, you are going to be one most miserable person. We've lost some of the mysticism. I'm not talking about, ooh, I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about seeing the spiritual side and the move and the power of the Holy Spirit in someone's lives or in a group or what have you, God's provision supernaturally because of prayer. We have gotten out of that because we now live in a society where, oh, just go to the government, fill out the forms, get the, get, you know, they'll give you a card or whatever, or they give you some food, or go here. We see all those things. We don't see God, we don't talk about, you know, what is it, I don't know if Chuck said it, but I mean, George Muller, if you know about him, he would never tell anybody what he needed. Even if they needed a bunch of money to fund the orphanages he had, he just went and prayed. And all of a sudden, he kept track of the prayers. He would never, until the end of the year, tell what the needs were of the body there, whatever organization he was in. And at the end of the year, when he gave a report, they always took in more than they needed. And he would just say, sometimes we'd be down to the last cracker, this, whether he would be he and his wife or the orphanage or whatever, and all of a sudden, boom, somebody drops off money or groceries or what have you. Now, this isn't a man that, this is not a man that's not working. But this is a man that believed in the provision and the power of the Holy Spirit to move in these areas the mystical, I, don't, I hate to say that because of the connotation nowadays, but the spiritual side of things. If you are devoid of that, if your life, your Christian life is devoid of that, if a church is devoid of that, and even Calvary chapels are treading close to the edge on this nowadays, then you, we, you won't see that jubilant life. You will not see those things. We will just learn to depend on everything else and every. Every board meeting is just a business meeting and it's just numbers crunching and there's, there's no room for the Holy Spirit to move because we've crowded him out because of our logic, our flow charts and everything else. That is not what Christianity is about. Neither are our personal lives to be that way. Those things, that movement, that fluidity, that room for the provision of God to come through, those things are so important to building our faith to a constant communion with the Lord in our daily lives. Too many of us are killing ourselves trying to live on bread alone. And then Jesus 
ask just another rhetorical question. Does worry, especially about these things, add to our height or to the longevity of our lives? No. Any doctor can tell you. Stress and worry shorten your life. You know who, out of the medical profession, what group has the shortest lifespan, or did a few years ago? Doctors, cardiologists specifically. Lifespan of 55 years. Most of them die from a heart attack. Because they're probably not exercising, doing they're probably not, you know, practicing what they're preaching. I don't know. But that's the point. Worry and stress and all that kind of stuff, it's not going to help. There's even a commercial out. I don't even know what they're advertising, but I heard it on the radio. Oh, stress, that or worrying. Doesn't that make it always better? And they go on talking about all the 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 uh, positives about worry, and then they come to the end and essentially say not. It doesn't help. So why do you do it? It doesn't work. We everybody knows that those things shave years off your life, of off of your life. So why do we do it when our Father has provided this for us? So let me put it this way: Do your children come up to you and express concern? Oh, Father. I'm in dire straits as to whether or not the electric bill will be paid this month. No. It doesn't cross their mind. They're just mad because there's not enough Cheerios in the cabinet. Macaroni and cheese. That never crosses their mind. And I just realized I, I gave this bogus, somewhat British accent, and I got people with <laughs> British accents in the back. They tell me that's more Australian, which is kind of like redneck English or something. That's what I've been told. I don't know. I say that as a native-born American redneck, so I don't mean that as any negative thing. But I've been told my, my British accent is not really British. Also tried to speak what few German words I knew to a German uh, transfer student one time, and she didn't understand any of them. So, so he goes on to verse 28. So why do you worry about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin, once again meaning the weave. And yet I say to you that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Now if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is, and tomorrow is thrown in the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? Therefore do not worry, saying, What shall we eat? What shall we drink? What are we going to wear? For after these, and this is what, no, this is what hits me in the heart. Right here when I read this part. For after these things the Gentiles seek. You say, well, you're a Gentile. Yeah, but you've got to understand the context. Gentile is not a good thing to be called in the Jewish context. They're heathens, pagans, godless. You know, all these, there, there's nothing positive in the Jewish world about being a Gentile. So these things the Gentiles seek, you have just, we have, though if you worry about those things, you have, are sort of being placed in that category. Think about it. Not good. For your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. Once again, Jesus reiterates how we are valued above the rest of creation. And then the last portion portion of verse 30, he chides us for being caught up in materialism, saying we have little faith. So he equates materialistic lifestyle with little faith, and that's exactly what most worry is, is a lack of faith. I'm not talking about concern. We heard at Hector's diagnosis, we were concerned. We heard Vivian's diagnosis, we were concerned. We heard Pevensey's diagnosis, we were concerned. All right? So what do most of us do? We go and we pray. But most of us, unless we're right there in the middle of that, you know, right there in the part of the family, most of us didn't pull our hair out for 24 hours a day trying to figure it out. What do we do? We go to the Lord with it. And we can say in all fairness, well, but you're not as directly affected. I understand that. But that same sort of mindset applies here. We went to the Lord. Nobody's, there's, you know, at that point, you're, you're running totally on faith. We realize that each of those circumstances, the doctors involved are like, ugh, none of this is good. Whether it's for Vivian, Pevensey, or Hector. Ugh, none of this is good. And all of a sudden, now they're like, wow, what's going on? Well, it's got to be from the power of prayer, but it's, it's faith. And having dealt with those families the way I have, I know they were concerned. I know they were worried. I know they didn't sleep sometimes. But for the most part, for the most part, what I've seen, I'm not just talking about watching them walk by, talking to them, there was something else there. 
There was faith there. An admission that God is sovereign and the ball is in his court. We want it to turn out a certain way. God help us. And that's what has brought them through. And you've seen them uh, benefit from that. But if we accept once again that we are the pinnacle of creation, that we really have a heavenly father up there looking out for us, and if we are sold out to him, singly focused, now I'm attaching it to what we talked about a couple of weeks ago, realizing that where our treasure is, our hearts are also, that's the barometer, then we have no need to be anxious over these things. In fact, you can say it's an insult or a slap in the face of God to worry or to be paralyzed with anxiety about our basic provision. I didn't say major sickness. I'm talking about ba uh, major basic provisions here. And why do I use such strong language in a statement? Because he told us that he will provide, and either he will or he is a liar, and God cannot lie. Now, that's the foundation. You've got you to put your foot on it. God cannot lie. There's a basis for your theology. There's a basis for your worldview. That is a foundational basis. Uh, block there. All right, I've got that. I believe that. Right, I'm standing on that. All right, now what's the next block? All right, God cannot lie. He goes into verse 31 saying, Therefore, do not worry, saying, What shall we eat? What shall we drink? What shall we wear? For after all these things the Gentiles seek, for your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. Therefore, there it is again, because of this. Do not worry about food, drink, or clothing. But we do sometimes, don't we? And I think some of that is our culture and our standards. I'll go back to Operation Christmas Child. All around the globe, there are going to be children in the third world, predominantly, I guess, getting a shoebox for Christmas. And it's going to have a few small things. Some of them are things they need. Some of them might have a ball, or a pen, some crayons, whatever. You know, you know basically what it is. Now, let me ask you this. Those of us that have kids, if our kids got that same box, what would Christmas morning be like? Mm. <laughs> Nobody loves me. My life is over. Blah, blah. Christmas things, blah, blah, blah. Why is that? Because they've already got this much. You know, so you give them a little box with some little stuff, you know, it doesn't make, it's, it's like hauling water to the sea. It doesn't make a difference. To the kid in the third world, man, that's everything. And they'll cherish it. That stuff is not going to be torn up three days from now and forgotten about and just laying out in the yard or in the back of a closet somewhere. No, that stuff is going to be put, if they even have a place to put it up somewhere, and that ball, that coloring book, that whatever, that little doll, that little Superman, whatever it is they got, that thing is like, oh. Like the first time I got a knife. That was a rite of passage where I was from. Got a knife. Yeah. I'm a man. And dad's, you know, saying how to use it, not to cut towards yourself. You know, don't be stupid. Don't stick it in your eye. Don't do anything like that. You know. I remember the first time I cut myself. I just went, ah! You know, but that was a rite of passage. That thing, and I kept that thing I've had in my pocket. My grandfather, my dad gave me a set of knives that were from Germany. But um, uh, my grandfather, once my father allowed me to have a knife, he took me down the street, down the highway to the little, little general store in the middle of nowhere, and he bought me a pocket knife. I don't know what it's called. But I mean, I put it in my pocket. I take it out, put it in my pocket, take it out, open it up, look at it, stick it back in my pocket. Go around, find other kids, go around to the fort in the woods. Look, man, I got a knife. Oh, he's got a knife. Let me see it. Don't cut your eye out or anything. You know, that it was, oh. Now, I can't imagine you gave a kid a knife, like, what's that for? Can you type with it? <laughs> oh, look, I can get it, I get to the battery and the cell phone better. You know, it's a whole different world. But it's because it's our standard. We already have so much. And so when we say provision, clothing, all this, we're thinking about filling up a walk-in closet and needing 200 pairs of shoes. And, and all this other stuff, and 10 pairs of jeans, and this shirt, and that shirt, you know, that's what we think about. That's not what he's talking about here. Those were the things, once again, that's a different lifestyle, different culture. That's why he says in verse 32, for after all these things the Gentiles seek. Seek. 
if we fall into the trap of materialism, we are categorized with the Gentiles, the heathen. They don't believe. Their focus is different. Unfortunately, what happens is so many people in churches, their focus has never changed from the, the heathen, the before Christ, or however you want to say it, before they believed, whatever, however nice you want to spread it on there. It hadn't changed. Oh, I'm saved. I got fire insurance. And they go, and the, none of this has changed. That is so wrong. It's not what Jesus is about changing lives. And that's what the whole purpose of this entire Sermon on the Mount is that there is to, if it's real, there's a change. You cannot be living like the heathen. You, your priorities cannot be the same as the heathen. You can't be living together. You can't be doing all these things if you say you're a follower of Jesus. You can't be doing those things. There's supposed to be a change. A changed life is, is uh, evidence of a changed life is a changed life. Hello? Somebody's ringing. I don't know. But, but he goes on. Uh, your heavenly father, I said, I don't fault anybody for that because when I first started as a senior pastor, I'm closing out a church service and my phone in my pocket ringing. I, had, I, mean, I remember, dear heavenly father, ring. And, and I just said, that's all right. And I said, yes, Lord. I had to roll with it. Trying to figure out how to cut off. Those are in the old days where, you know, you just had the, you know, where they were smartphones. But he goes into this. God knows we, we need these things to survive. He addressed food in the garden. He briefed Noah on his diet as soon as he got off the ark. God knows we need to eat, and he knows we don't need to be running around naked. He even made clothes for Adam and Eve. So he changes the focus. These are not these things, clothes and food, not, are not to be our priority. He then gives you the priority in verse 33. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. His righteousness. The thing with which we are really clothed that makes all the difference. And all these things shall be added to you. They're down the list. They're not the top. Seek ye first. What's the first on the list? God and his kingdom. If you're so busy, if you're busy looking at God and his kingdom and all that, guess what? You're not worried so much about what you're wearing. And that doesn't mean you don't wash your clothes and you don't comb your hair and you don't brush your teeth and use deodorant and all that kind of stuff. But all of a sudden, those things are just basic stuff and you're just so busy, you don't have time to worry about that stuff. And this is the conditional part of this. Seek ye first the kingdom of God. Jesus to whom is he speaking? Believers, disciples, followers. And as believers, we are to seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Once again, that's our priority. This comes before earthly relationships. Oh, you get in trouble right here. i tell you right quick. Now you quit preaching and going to meddling. As soon as you tell a wife, your first priority is not your children. You better duck. You're going to get shot. First priority is the Lord. Then guess who? And my kids. Not your husband. Uh-uh. Oh, yes, I think so. That's what this says. You can do all this you want. That's what this says. That's what it says. That's our first priority. Come before our earthly, earthly relationships, even our spouses and children. Doesn't mean that we are to neglect those relationships. In fact, it means just the opposite because a man who is focused on God's kingdom and the righteousness of God will be the best husband and father. Same goes for the woman that does the same thing. She will be the best mother and wife. But this peace and this sustenance comes from God to the one seeking him as his or her top priority. I've seen it. I've seen it a gazillion ways. Somebody is being called to something. Maybe it's ministry or moving something. And all of a sudden, one spouse or the other puts down their foot. Nope. Uh-uh. I'm not doing that. I got my little world. I got my house. I got my picket fence. I got 2.3 children. And the tax deductions are working. And this is our little bubble. And whatever might upset that little basket, kill it. Say, no, 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 no. No, 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 because if, the, 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 if whatever's upsetting that little basket is God, keep it. Keep your little world. 
Because you're going to be as miserable as ten hells trying to keep it. Because you're fighting God now. I've seen it a gazillion times. Oh, God's called it. God always calls, it seems like God always calls us to something bigger and better and snazzier and fancier. Not necessarily. Sometimes he pulls you down the ladder as the world sees it. God would call us to this and I got to give up my new car for a three-year-old car with 70,000 miles on it. Oh, God is torturing us. Yeah, tell that to the lady down the street who's got some hoopty she has to pour three quarts of oil in and jump it off every time just to get down the road. But that's the way we look at it. We base our problems always against somebody with Donald Trump's money. And so, oh, woe is me. Well, look at somebody down there in the hood that doesn't have a pot or a window. And then see how good you've got it. All of these things, this peace, this sustenance, these come from the one, once again, who's seeking God, seeking him as his or her top priority, not the one that places God somewhere lower down the list, not to the one that is playing church, not to the one who isn't willing to pay the price of being an enemy to the world and all its promises. You want something that will help you? Here's a book. The Cost of Discipleship. You know who wrote it? I know you know, Jacob. Dietrich Bonhoeffer. A man who died, Nazis killed him for his faith, his testimony, and his work. That's the cost of discipleship. Not moving down from a 2,500 square foot house to a 2,000 square foot house. That's the cost of discipleship. Read it. It'll change your life. Now, if you are a warrior by nature, don't raise your hand if you're married to one of those. If you are a warrior by nature, then uh, Jesus has something more to say to you. Look at verse 34. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will, uh, will worry about its own things. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. Now look, you can't change the past. Worrying about the future is not going to help e either. But if you want to worry, if you just got to worry, if you're one of those people that I'm not happy unless I have something to worry about, you're one of those who as soon as you win the lottery and you have all that you need, or what are the taxes going to be on that? You know, if you're one of those that worries, you know, if you're one of those that gets to heaven and then is worried about something once you're in there, if you're one of those people, then the Lord talks about this. He says, if you want to worry, there's enough to worry about just concerning today's needs. So focus on that. If you need something to worry about, you need something to do, focus on just today, not tomorrow, not what happened yesterday. Can you change it? No. Then why are you making yourself crazy about it? Because that's the way I choose to. No, you're making yourself crazy. You're probably making everybody else in the house crazy. And this is, again, this is why Jesus tells us, pray for our daily bread. Lord, we need to feed us today and next week. And if you'd go ahead, I'm just going to put in a request for the rest of the year, and we won't have to address this any longer. No, no, he, he purposely said daily bread. Why? So you've got to come back and talk to him tomorrow. That's the way it's got to work. Deal with today, today. Deal with tomorrow, tomorrow. We aren't placed on this planet to accumulate stuff. We weren't placed here to build our own kingdom. And I hope you have what you need. I know I'm not, I'm not, God didn't say you had to take a vow of poverty or there's no, I talked about that last time, there's no righteousness in poverty or not having anything, but he is talking about the priorities. I mean, let's be honest. If he wanted us to just be stark, raving, uh, starving to death, he could have easily let us be born in some other country. But this is the context in which we've been placed. So within that context, our priorities don't change from someone in the third world. The priority is still seeking God first. But there's a difference between starving here and starving there. Starving here means there's only 15 things to choose from out of the refrigerator instead of 30. And I'm too lazy to, to make a sandwich. We don't have anything to eat. That's starving over here. You should remember this, as the Reverend Jasper Williams said, there's always someone else who is worse off than you. And there will always be someone who is better off than you, 
Don't fall into the trap of materialism. So let me, so let me leave you with this. There was this rich man who was um, seeing his therapist. And he's laying there on the couch while the therapist, of course, sits over there. I don't know what they, I've never been to one. But I'm wondering what are they writing. They're probably just doodling because they're going to get their 150 bucks an hour and they want you to come back for the next 10 years. They, you know, they hardly, they never really cure anything. So he's sitting there. And, the, and the, the guy's talking about, you know, I just don't understand. I got this m big mansion in the Hamptons, eight-car garage. and I got a beach house in Boca Raton. I got a big yacht. I've even got a house down in the Bahamas. And, uh, you know, I got a private jet. I got all these cars at each one of these places, big, humongous Pool, swimming pool. You know, if I had a one, you know, it used to be that a kidney-shaped pool was what everybody wanted. Mine would have a stone in it if, uh, if I had one. But you got all this stuff, and he's like, and I don't get it. I've got everything I've ever wanted, and I'm still not happy. And he's laying there, and the therapist is sitting there doodling. He says, well, you got a Rolex? And the guy sits up, I don't have a Rolex. As if that, adding to that to the pile is going to make him happy. Always chasing the next thing. I want to ask you this. Will you reprioritize pre your life? That's what we're talking about. Not taking a vow of poverty. We're talking about reprioritizing. Will your chief focus be on God and his kingdom? Now, if you say yes, then there's going to be, once again, there's got to be evidence of a change. Will you put your treasure in your heart where it should be as a child and servant of God? Now think before you answer, before you commit to that. We're not talking about some easy believism here. We're not just selling fire insurance. We are past that point at the Sermon on the Mount. These are people that say they are believers, they are followers, and Jesus is telling them, all right, if you really are, then this is what you're going to see. You're going to be going against the flow of humanity. People are going to think you're crazy. Maybe some of you are already thought to be crazy. I can get that. But now for different reasons. Will you seek first God's kingdom and his righteousness, the righteousness which he has provided for us in Christ, because that is a total priority changer. It's a game changer, as Tony would say. It totally scrambles everything. If not, then, hey, you either are saved and haven't addressed this issue, or maybe you're not really saved. And it's not easy, but it is what is required of us by our master, the one who bought us at the most exorbitant price the universe has ever known. He paid the price. For us, it's free because nobody could pay it. So it has to be given away. But God has already paid that price, the most exorbitant of a price in the universe. That is what your life as a believer is worth. You cannot define it by material possessions. And if that is how you have defined your life, your success, your status, or whatever, I feel sorry for you. Will you commit to this? Dear Heavenly Father, Lord God, we thank you for all the sustenance and the provision that you've given us, Lord. We seem to see that everything is a two-sided coin. With grace, there's also justice. With mercy, the other side, sometimes punishment. Lord, we've seen in the history of Israel that whenever you bless them, Lord, things were just great for a while, and then the blessing actually becomes an idol. And then they're back on that track where a prophet has to come and speak, where the word of God has to go forth, where... Um, you bring in some outside nation to discipline them because they have forgotten you because of the blessings you gave them. And Lord, we are no different. Maybe sometimes worse as Americans. But the most blessed nation there is, materially speaking. But our blessings tend to distract us from the one who bestowed us with those blessings. Lord, I ask that we would have a heart here today of new priorities, especially as we go into the next year.
new priorities as we go, as we approach Christmas. That we see the real reason for the season. The ultimate gift. And the life we've been given because of that gift. That these are only possible. What we've talked about today is only possible. For those who love you. Who truly seek to follow you. And hunger and thirst after your righteousness and your kingdom. Lord God I pray you make us those people. Our lives will change, this church will change, and through that, this community will change. Lord, it'll be a personal revival all the way around. Father, that's what I ask. So, Father, as, the, as we sing going out, Lord, as we leave here today, Lord, as we come back here tonight and we're enjoying the festivities with each other, um, and all that you've given us as we celebrate this season, Lord, I ask you to just start Kicking away that we've reprioritized and put you back at the top of the list. And then because of that, we'll eliminate so much of the things that cause us discomfort and anxiety. Father, thank you for your provision. Most of all, your provision for our salvation. As we read here today, Lord God, your provision for our most basic needs. We thank you for that, Lord God. And I pray that we see you as the provider of that. Father, Bless us as we go out through this, throughout this season, Lord. Uh, help us to uh, help others focus on the real meaning of this, Father. And we thank you once again for your mercy and the ultimate gift of your Son, Jesus Christ, and his obedience to you, Father. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.